Jesus and his companions enter a small village of Bethany, not far from Jerusalem, nearing the end of a long trip. They've walked from Galilee up in the north, down through Samaria, and now finally are nearing their destination in the south, Jerusalem. Jesus has increasingly been trying to prepare his fellow travelers for some end that he insists is imminent. He sent them out two by two, training them to carry his message by themselves. He's been pushing them with his teachings. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, but I say love even your enemies. It's been an exhausting journey, exhilarating but confusing too. So as Jesus and his group draw near to Jerusalem, they must be hoping for some place to settle for a while and rest, to break bread, talk among friends, to regroup before that final leg of their journey. In Bethany, the travelers' prayers are answered. Martha says she will welcome them in. They're relieved and grateful, we assume. Martha may even be a special friend, her home, a destination, which Jesus and the apostles, the disciples, have been hungrily anticipating, an oasis. Mary, the second sister, attends to Jesus, honors him by listening to what he has to say, engaging him in conversation, perhaps, or just being present. Jesus rarely lectured. He engaged others. So maybe Jesus and Mary both listened. We don't know. Neither do we know exactly the content of the talk that day. Jesus sharing what he had been going through. Questions Mary had stored up about her own life. Ideas perhaps that they're puzzling through together. What, what gives life its greatest joy? How to survive in tough times. All we know really is that some time must have passed in conversation because Martha, the host who has welcomed them, suddenly is speaking to Jesus. Don't you even care, Jesus, that Mary has abandoned me to do all the work alone? Make her help me. Oh, it's awkward, uncomfortable. There must have been some silence as Jesus and Mary sort out how to respond. For me, this story of Martha and Mary can rankle. I think it's true for many women, especially if it seems that we have to choose between the two sisters. Who are you, you active church women? We are often quizzed, are you Mary or are you Martha? You see, you must choose between sitting with Jesus like Mary or serving him like Martha, between learning and deepening your faith on the one hand or acting it out on the other, between worship in the church and justice on the streets. But that's a false dichotomy. Both deep reflection and courageous action are important, best when they're interwoven. That's what I learned in a life pressing forward on justice issues as best I knew when I was a lawyer before becoming a minister. It's what I learned especially from my five years working at another city church here in Boston, leading social justice programs. That was my portfolio. An annual million-dollar budget for work with city kids and the homeless, those grappling with violence, the mentally ill. I am convinced compassionate action cannot be sustained unless we pray and reflect to understand others and, and ourselves with compassion. Without this inner work, outward acts devolve too easily for people, especially like us, gathered here into righteous handouts to those who seem lesser, or our acts become consumed by bitter resentment against forces we can't change. We escalate up to violence, at least verbally, or descend to despair and burnout. That was my experience. Compassionate action can't be sustained for the long haul unless we also reflect together as a community. We talk and pray hard. But equally true, I found, meaningful worship and quiet reflection always fuel genuine acts of service. If they don't, the worship and prayer is empty. It's fear and hypocrisy that breed all talk and no action. And the best worship and prayer is designed to unclench our fists from our tight grips on 
those strategies that we use to protect ourselves from ever taking a stand. You know, the little white lies we tell ourselves, that we can't make a difference, the fear of that dangerous neighborhood that lets us justify our inaction. No, we can't pit Martha the doer against Mary, Jesus' disciplined students. Each of us needs within us both of them. Every community requires both types of people. It's also always been irksome to me that Martha seems to be chastised by Jesus, a rebuke against the invisible work so often done in another room unheralded, often by women or by others quiet in their servanthood like our senior warden, Cliff Allen. When Jesus sent out his disciples two by two, he had said that if no one welcomes them in the villages, they should leave that village in the dust. And Martha has exhibited model behavior, welcoming the disciples in her village. Yet her welcoming hand seems to get slapped. Moreover, Jesus has just lavished praise on the Good Samaritan because he went out of his way for the stranger, not only tending his wounds, but also generously providing for the man's ongoing care at a nearby inn, hospitality above and beyond the call of duty. So it seems a bit too much to me when Martha attempts the same generous hospitality and in some interpretations Jesus implies that boiled hot dogs would have been sufficient. Martha, Martha, you're overdoing it. Are you seeking praise for a gourmet meal? Just chill. I hope that if that scene were being replayed today, Jesus would apologize to Martha and suggest that all the talk move into the kitchen where, where everyone can help with the meal and Martha can participate also. But these interpretations, as important as they are for our life together as a church, I think still fall short of the complete message that is gifted to us today in this passage, because notice the words that Martha uses. I think the words caught Jesus' attention too. Martha says, don't you even care, Jesus? Don't you even care, Jesus, that my sister has abandoned me? Jesus has heard exactly these words before, the very same phrase, don't you even care, Jesus? words flung at him earlier in his ministry. So he's suddenly back at that earlier time. They had all been out on a boat on their familiar Sea of Galilee, known so well to disciples who'd grown up on its shore. A huge storm had suddenly sprung up, one that the gap in the hills surrounding the lake sometimes creates because there's a vicious wind tunnel. It was always scary. Former fishermen, among them knew others who'd been lost in storms just like that, and they were terrified when their boat begins taking on water. Jesus, exhausted, is asleep in the stern. Don't you even care, Jesus? His friends had shouted frantically, don't you even care that we could die? Don't you even care, Jesus? Piercing words to one who cared so much, who had spent so long every word, every action trying to convey this one thing that he did care beyond words, and that a power beyond them all did care, always had, always would care for them. But his followers back on that Sea of Galilee didn't know that yet, not really, so they'd been afraid in that boat. And now Martha, so long afterwards, when Jesus' ministry is nearly spent, is using the same exact words. Do you even care, Jesus? She says those words in the house that should be her safest refuge. Martha suddenly feeling roiled by those waves of strangers waiting for their meal. In her life, Martha suddenly feels roiled by those strong winds that are picking up the growing realization of the enormous dangers that she and Jesus and the others will soon face in Jerusalem. Martha, beginning to be drenched now in her fear as it splashes in all around her, admitting to herself how dangerous life always is, 
how fragile each of us always is. And all this explodes in her question, don't you even care, Jesus, that I've been abandoned by my own sister and I'm afraid of drowning? Don't you even care, Jesus? Meaning, do I count? Does what happens to me matter at all to you or to anyone, to the one we call God? Don't you even care? Ask the marchers of us as innocent black men are killed by our police. Don't you even care? Ask police officers of us. When we who protect you think we're about to be shot and fear for our lives, don't you even care? Ask Central American teenagers of you. When your country's refusal of us at your man-made border sends us home to our deaths from violent gangs, don't you even care, God, when cancer is destroying my body, when my job vanishes, when my beloved dies and I'm all alone. God, oh God, don't you even care when a truck mows down a crowd just watching fireworks, when a shooter mows down a crowd just dancing on a Friday night. Do black lives matter? Gay lives, immigrant lives, my life my little life, do we even count? All those months ago on the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus' hand-picked followers had cried out, don't you even care, we're told that Jesus had commanded the wind and sea to be still, the cause of all their suffering to end. And we might wish God would always do just that. Eradicate the storms, ignore the dynamics of wind tunnels, turn the law of physics on its head, prove through defiance of the universe's workings that God cares. But instead, that day in Galilee, early in his ministry, once the wind had still, Jesus got to the real heart of the matter. Don't you trust yet, he asked his students, that God cares about you? that you will be all right in the deepest sense, even if you were to die. But they'd all stayed silent. So since then, Jesus has been trying so hard to show them how they can calm their own inward storms even after he's gone, how they can work together two by two to live from a place of calm. Jesus has been honing his words because he actually did understand how hard it is for any human to trust that God might care for us when the world all around us seems not to. Howard Thurman, the former chaplain at Howard University and Boston University, explains this brilliantly in his little volume that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. often carried with him. It's entitled, Jesus and the Disinherited. Jesus, a desperately poor Jew, a minority in the Greco-Roman world, viscerally understand what you and I sometimes may not, but sometimes do. That for the masses of humanity who live every day, not just sometimes, with their back against the wall, who face overwhelming odds against ever really thriving, their daily struggle is to survive with their dignity intact, their humanity in place? Should they resist their plight or accept it? Should they resist by raising voices or even weapons against all the forces, all our policies, all our blind eyes that convey with great clarity that their lives don't matter? Or is it wiser for these, including all the poor Jews of Jesus' time, his own disciples, is it wiser to just acquiesce in order to survive, to try to blend in or at least hold their tongue those seething inside. To these two painful options, resist with violence or acquiesce, says Howard Thurman. Jesus came forth with still another option, resistance based on this formula, the kingdom of heaven is in us. Act empowered by that certainty. Quote, Jesus focused with ever greater urgency on this solution as the only one that allows people to survive with dignity. 
They need a radical change in their inner attitude. God cares for the grass of the field which lives a day and is no more. For the sparrow that falls unnoticed by the wayside, he holds the stars in their appointed places, leaves his mark in every living thing, and he cares for me. To the degree to which a man knows this, says Thurman, he is unconquerable from within and without. Quote, Jesus knew that no external force, however great and overwhelming, can destroy a people if that force doesn't first win victory over their inner lives, their spirit. Jesus therefore came back, says Thurman, again and again to the inner life of the individual and in his ministry with increasing insight and startling accuracy placed his finger on the inward center as the crucial arena to determine the destiny of his people, of all peoples haunted by the humiliating cry, don't you even care? In the face of overwhelming odds, nothing less than this great daring hope and conviction that we all do matter can achieve the inner security in which fear cannot possibly survive. This trust that each is God's child, each one, you. Do you know this? That the kingdom of heaven is within you that you count are of infinite value? And do you, by words and acts, convey this to others, that they are of infinite value? Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, says that in the very midst of enormous suffering, can you return to that miracle of your breath, the miracle of your own life, and imbued with that awareness, walk with peace and compassion for others through the suffering? Jesus was so convinced of our infinite worth that later those trying to describe his inner calm could only say it was so strong. It was as if he could sleep through a violent storm at sea. It was so empowering that when he was with you it felt as if even the wind and the waves would obey him. Don't you even care, Jesus, Martha had asked. Oh, Martha, dear Martha. You already have the one thing you need. The kingdom of heaven is in you right now already because you are God's beloved, as certainly as grace is. Don't you even care? Many are asking this church right now. Do we trust enough that we already are part of God's beloved community that we fearlessly stand with others who have their backs against the wall, showing by deeds as well as words that we care. Sean and I have been meeting with other Boston clergy of all races at the 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury to break bread and to pray and to take action to plan it, the things we need to do for key criminal justice reforms. The plans we've had for a book group about the history of slavery within many Boston churches, including King's Chapel, those plans will continue in August. Tell me if you want to participate. Our adult education committee has invited excellent Muslim speakers to teach about Islam in the fall and take us to the Roxbury Mosque. Our community action committee is considering where we should be more active. There is so much to do in our city. It can be done by those with the still, calm center in the storm. They are unconquerable. We already have all we need. It's time to act. <laughs>